Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky arrived in Washington today for a White House visit with President Biden and a primetime address to Congress tonight. This marks Zelensky's first trip outside Ukraine since February's Russian invasion and comes right as Congress considers a $1.7 trillion spending package that includes nearly $45 billion for Ukraine. Included in the aid to Ukraine is $1.8 billion in weapons such as the Patriot Missile Defense System Zelensky has repeatedly requested. How will this affect Ukraine's battle against the Russian invasion? Joining me now to discuss this is FRC's Executive Vice President, retired Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, who spent the last four years of his 36-year military career serving as Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. He was also one of the original members of the U.S. Army's Delta Force. He joins me in studio. General, welcome back to Washington Watch. That's good to be with you, Joseph. Now let's talk a bit about this omnibus package. It's been criticized heavily for a variety of reasons, process as much as substance, um, but it includes uh, $45 billion nearly in Ukrainian aid, including, as we talked about this, um, the Patriot Missile Defense System, other things. What's your take on that aid package, appropriate or not? I think it is appropriate. Uh, the only thing that I uh, regret is that the Europeans are not paying a, a part of that. I think that the Europeans have gotten away with uh, not do, carrying their own weight there, and uh, and this is a European war, so we need to consider that. But uh, I'm all in for the for the Ukrainians, but I just don't think the American taxpayers should pay the whole bill. And, and let's talk about that a, a bit. Why is it that the American taxpayers are the ones largely funding this European war? Why are we willing to do it? Why are they not willing to do it? Well, I think we're willing to do it because we see it as a long term as a national security issue uh, for America. And uh, and how does that fall? How does that uh, uh, play out? Well, what if they what if uh, Putin takes the Ukraine and then he decides, well, OK, I'm going to rest up here for a while and I'm going to go after one of the other European nations like maybe Romania or Poland or uh, one of the Baltic uh, regions there. Uh, and then where does it stop? And, and then does that encourage China to now go after Taiwan? There's a lot at stake here. So I think that the uh, the Americans uh, should be involved in this. We should be helping. But I think the Europeans are slacking on this. And I think that they're, our president needs to show some leadership. You remember Donald Trump stood up before the NATO commanders and said, <laughs> pay your share. And they did. Yeah, and, but and, everybody well, they said paid much more. They paid they paid more, and uh, and what was interesting was everybody said, "Oh, he's just alienated us from our uh, allies. Uh, they're never going to work with us again." But what did they do in response to that? They paid up, and, uh, and and so it's time for Joe Biden to do the same thing now. One of the criticisms of U.S. aid to Ukraine is that we don't know what's actually happening to it. Do you have confidence that the money so far, and we've sent $48 billion so far to Ukraine in aids of various forms, do you have confidence that the money, the aid we've sent there has been used for the purposes intended? Well, the preponderance of it, yes. I think certainly yes. But uh, most countries in that part of the world, they have a, a significant level of corruption. And even though the Ukrainians are fighting for their lives. There is some Yehu out there that is going to take advantage and exploit this opportunity. So uh, I think that there is probably some level of corruption associated with that. But nonetheless, uh, what we can say is that the aid that we've sent them, they have put to very, very good use. And they have, uh, for the most part, they have really kicked the Russians around the battlefield there. Yeah, and to that point, you mentioned the concern that, well, if Putin is successful in Ukraine, who will he go after next, right? Because we know he's an ambitious guy. He has this vision of recreating the USSR, and that extends uh, far beyond Ukraine. Do you see that threat uh, as being as large as it is? Is it just as big of a threat now as it was back in February when he started, given how things have gone in Ukraine? No, I don't think it's as likely. That's the whole point. Yeah. That's that's why America is involved right now. That's why we're we're shoving equipment and material in there as quickly as we can. Uh, 
But no, I think that he has, this has been a total humiliation for Putin. And what he has done is he's actually unified NATO. Uh, and NATO is more unified now than I've seen in the, in the years that I've watched NATO or worked with the NATO nations. They're more unified now. And the, and the European Union is as well because they all have a common enemy. And that has a tendency to unify people. <laughs> it is galvanizing, right? Yeah. The, the friend, the enemy of your enemy is often your friend, and I, I, I do think we see that exactly dynamic right. at play. About foreign aid, for those of us who have never given or received foreign aid, is this really just a matter where the U.S. Treasury just writes a check to the Ukrainian government and they cash that? And we know that we've talked about like the Patriot Missile System, which is, of course, that's capital military aid, right? Pres presumably is shipped over. Um, but when we're just talking about money being sent that they can use, is that a check that is written? No, not always. A lot of times it's it's an in-kind uh, donation to them. And, and when you talk about this uh, $49 billion, almost, almost 49, uh, or 45, I'm sorry, uh, a lot of that is not necessarily going to be cash that we're giving them. It's going to be the kinds of materials that we are talking about here with the Patriot missiles and uh, some of the long-range artillery and the drones and the other, uh, even yeah. MRAPs, which is a, uh, a highly armored uh, mobility system that they can move around in a, uh, in a, mo in a mechanized environment. So uh, it, it comes in different ways. Sometimes it comes in the form of training. Sometimes... Uh, we uh, we fund training teams, mobile training teams that go over and 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 help them to uh, develop their tactics, their techniques, their their capabilities. Or uh, we pay sometimes to bring some of their people here to the United States to go to things like the uh, military colleges here, the U.S. Army War College, uh, the Navy. Uh, staff college, whatever it might be. So it comes in different forms, but it's not just a, a check, which based on the way we as Americans look at it, that's what we're talking about, but we're not. Yeah. That's really not the case. Should the American taxpayers be in this for the long haul until Putin just surrenders and goes home? Yes, but I'm going to go back and say, but Joe Biden needs to lean on the Europeans he needs to force them, as Donald Trump did, to pay up, pay their share. And that is something that, that uh, our president has not done. And until he does that, and until he shows them some resolve with regards to them paying their share, uh, we're going to continue to bear the burden on this. And I'm not in favor of that at all. Another topic for you, Afghanistan, uh, the Republican the new Republican leadership that will that will take uh, office in January in the next Congress has um, not threatened but promised that they are going to investigate the withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan uh, that, that happened last summer. And Ned Price, who is the, the Department of State spokesman, he has been commenting on this. And yesterday he talked about what happened in Afghanistan in terms of uh, maybe mission drift is the right way to refer to this. I want to play clip five, and then I want to give you a chance okay. to respond to this. Let's play that. We went into Afghanistan with uh, a defined mission. Many people lost sight of that mission over time, but we were successful uh, in concluding that mission. What's your response to that, General? Uh, I probably shouldn't say it on on the air. Well, that is but, a family uh, program. But yeah, this yes. is a family <laughs> program. That, that was nonsense. That was absolute lie. And this is another example of how this administration will look you right in the eye and lie to you. And that guy just lied to us in what he said. Listen, we went in there with a mission, and that was to get all the Americans out and to get those allies who had worked with us, fought with us during the 20 years that we were there. And we did not do that. And, and this president was hard-headed and would not listen to the advice of the people that really know more about this kind of thing than he does. Uh, he closed an air base that was fully functional, that was not in a major metropolitan area, and we could have used that as a place to uh, launch this thing from. 
and uh, he refused that, and then he wouldn't establish a debt. I mean, he established a deadline, but he wouldn't modify that deadline. He, he, he could not bring himself to modify the deadline to give us more time to get the rest of those people, many of which were Americans. There are Americans still there. That guy just lied to us. We're used to congressional investigations. They seem to be perpetual in one thing or another, and we know that the uh, House Democrats have been investigating President Trump, you know, the entire time that they've been in office the last Still two are. years. Still, yeah, and, and presumably would continue to as long as they could. Um, now the House Republicans are going to investigate uh, President Biden on a number of things, including the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Is this merely just politicking in an attempt to just kind of smear your political opponents? Is there something substantive that we can learn that we need to learn from these investigations that makes this question in this inquiry more than just political grandstanding. Yeah, no, I think there's some, there's some very practical reasons why we need to do this. First of all, the, the, this whole situation in Afghanistan was probably the largest uh, single foreign policy failure in U.S. history. I mean, look, we, we, we have an ethos that says we'll never leave an American behind. Look, I, I, Joseph, I don't want to get into war stories, but right. I commanded an operation that fought for 18 hours in Mogadishu, Somalia, to get two dead bodies out of a crashed airplane. Nobody was going to leave them. We were not going to leave them. Now, contrast that to Benghazi. Contrast that to Afghanistan. Our standard, our ethos, our value is that we don't leave people behind. Yet that's exactly what we did there, and the, and the president just simply wanted to hear nothing more about it. He wanted to claim victory just like this guy did on this program here just a few minutes ago. He wanted to claim a victory and convince the Americans just like he wants to convince us that the border is secure. Our lying eyes are telling us something entirely different. And that is that seems to be a pattern for this administration. And I got to tell you, I think it's wearing thin on a lot of Americans. One other issue I want to get to you, get to with you very quickly, is the Iran nuclear deal. Um, President Biden um, kind of got caught on camera saying that this is dead. Let's play clip six. There's an exchange here uh, that that I want you to react to. President Biden. So the audio there is a little challenging, but someone asks him, President Biden, would you please announce the JCPOA is dead? That's the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, can you announce that? He says, no. She says, why not? And he says, well, there's a lot of reasons. It's dead, but we're not going to announce it. Long story. What's your reaction to his acknowledgement that it's dead, but his uh, desire to not confirm that? Well, I'm one of the probably the happiest people <laughs> that's watched this so far. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad that it's dead. I'm glad that Tell he recognized Tell us why. Why are you glad yeah. that it's dead? Listen, this, uh, if you go back and look at the original JCPOA before Trump pulled out of it, uh, it actually put the, uh, the, the military there on a footing to have a nuclear weapon. So it was a matter of it may have taken as much as the long, long goal would have been 10 years, but they were still going to get a nuclear weapon. Now, when was that? When was that signed? 2015. So we're already five years into, or no, seven years into that window. So uh, it would put them on a pathway to a to a nuclear weapon. And if you look at how flawed it was, for example, we had to call them and give them uh, X amount of notice before we could go in and uh, and actually uh, look at one of their sites and actually do an inspection of that site. And uh, military sites were off limits <laughs> altogether. Yeah. So look at all of those things that we agreed to under the Obama administration. Now, what's the other part of it is? The other part of it is when Iran has a nuclear weapon, they are a threat not only to our great allies in that part of the country or that part of the world, uh, the Israelis, but also to the Saudis and mm -hmm. to the other Gulf countries for that matter. because. As one of my friends uh, from the Middle East that uh, I wrote a book with, as a matter of fact, 
Uh, he's a former Muslim Brotherhood terrorist, but he told me, if there is only one bomb, it goes to Israel. If there's two, the second one goes to Saudi Arabia. The Saudis and the Iranians have a long-standing feud. They are not allies. They're all Muslims. But it's a Sunni-Shia split. It's an Arab-Persian split. And uh, nobody w is, is happier than those two countries there because they that's their sworn enemies. So why won't he just announce that it's dead in about uh, 30 seconds? Because he made a big issue of the fact that he was going to reverse a Donald Trump uh, policy. Okay. And get us back into this, you know, just like he, he, he reversed so many of those policies that were implemented during the Trump administration. And he came out and very proudly thumped his chest and said, he's, we're back into JCPOA. Well, he doesn't want to have to now go out and say, well, they told us to take a hike. <laughs> So you he know. agrees with Trump, but he just doesn't want anybody to know Well, that. I don't know if he agrees with Trump or not, but he certainly doesn't want to have to admit that he made a yeah. serious mistake and underestimated the uh, the people there, the mullahs that uh, make up the Supreme Council there. General Boykin, educational as always. Thanks so much for your time. Good to be with you, Joseph.